So welcome uh, booktube viewers one and all. I'm going to try something for the first time today and that is to start my own uh, booktube tag and uh, see who's going to play along. Uh, I'm going to nominate uh, some people that I'm tagging and I will uh, in the description box for this put all their uh, links to their booktube channels uh, and I'll also list the books that um, that I mentioned in, in my own version of the tag. So the tag itself is character traits uh, which I hope will provide uh, a platform for uh, people to talk about the characters that they love and hate, but specific aspects of them uh, that they've come across in literature. So uh, the first one is, um, which is the most unreliable narrator you've ever come across? So uh, it seems uh, not uh, ironic that in an age of fake news, um, unreliable narrators seem to be sort of more and more uh, prevalent in literature, by which I mean uh, narrators uh, who deliberately withhold information or put out false information as a conscious act. It's not the other characters that they want to sort of mislead, which is a sort of staple of literature, but it's actually the reader. They're playing a game with the reader. Uh, and that's sort of the definition of an unreliable narrator. Um, so I want to go a bit further with my choice, and that is the female protagonist of David Markson's uh, novel Wittgenstein's Mistress. And uh, this is a different type of unreliable narrator in that she's unreliable because you just don't know at what level she's operating on. You don't know if she's mad um, or if she just seems to involve uh, in, in uh, inhabit a, a sort of solipsistic world. She's the only character in the book. And one of the suggestions, perhaps, that she wants you to believe is that she's the last person on Earth, that everyone else has sort of died out, uh, which may or may not be true. You don't know. She keeps you off balance the whole time. So it's basically her sort of wandering through the world. Uh, she claims to be a former artist, but when she comes across an art museum, she destroys the art on the wall. Um, she seems to have known sort of every famous writer, philosopher, artist, and so a lot of it is anecdotes with them. And she's called Wittgenstein's mistress, so maybe she did move in that in that world. But it just, as I say, it just keeps you off balance because... It's a world entirely solipsistic. It's entirely through her eyes and as if no other world exists, which could be one of the answers. But, you know, is she mad? Is she insane? It's it's quite an unsettling book. It's not wholly successful, but it's a very interesting experience to undergo. And just a very uh, brief mention for a second unreliable narrator, and that's in uh, Raymond Federman's book, Take It or Leave It, which has a very nice device... Um, where uh, the narrator actually pays another character to take on the narration for him at some point so he can go off and do something else because he's got fed up with narrating. And I just thought that was sort of quite a nice a nice little thing. OK, so question two. Which character are you most afraid of? Um, there's an American writer called Blake Butler who is a notorious insomniac and just sort of works all through the night. And, and I don't know if this affects his writing, but it's very dark. It's very unsettling. And he wrote a book called The 300 Million. And uh, the, the premise of this book seems to be, again, it's not entirely clear, that uh, a character called uh, Gretch Garvey has started up a death cult. And it's his stated ambition to kill every single citizen in America, hence the title 300 million. So they start off with his sort of little gang of recruits and they sort of snatch women off the streets and murder them. But it, it spreads like a virus and it's not just women. You know, these guys basically just sort of accelerate it up. And Garvey gets captured uh, before all 300 million Americans are, are killed. And part of the book is the interrogation and the unfortunate policeman has to try and get inside this guy's head. And it's it's a deeply, deeply unsettling book. But, but you know, if you've got a strong stomach, um, definitely uh, worth reading. But Garvey frightens me, um, both the sort of the idea of someone committed to killing an entire nation, but just the way Butler writes him. It's, it's, it's very opaque trying to get inside a mind so alien to our own. So question three, uh, which character cracks you up with laughter? Uh, changing the tone after that one. Uh, that's easy for me. It's um, Saul Carew in the uh, novel Carew by Steve Tessick, who I mentioned in my uh, No Disclaimers tag. Uh, unfortunately, Tessick died soon after this novel. But Carew is just, you know, a lovable loser who's, who's you know, got a pet project to film of uh, some sort of Star Wars tribute and... He sort of has these meetings trying to sort of hook up with movie producers and he's just, you know, he he's useless. He can't do it. And his relationships with men, women and he's just very, very funny. Laugh out loud on every page. Um, it's that good. 
Uh, question four. Which character has a lifestyle you could see yourself living? Um, this is a bit of a tough one for me because um, I am an impoverished writer, really. I, I, you know, I don't even sort of have a lifestyle, and at least not sort of materially. The only thing I buy is books. I used to buy records, but was, everything's digitised. I, you know, I, I don't even do that anymore. Um, I very rarely buy clothes. I don't have a car. Don't go on holiday. Uh, all these sorts of things. So um, lifestyle doesn't really sort of compute for me. But uh, one book that sort of um, had its attractions is called uh, The Thought Gang by Tibor Fisher. And there's uh, the main character of that is called Eddie Coffin, who's a philosophy graduate who manages to con his way to be a philosopher don in an English university. But um, he's a total slacker and uh, with sort of slight criminal tendencies. And uh, he's forced to go on the run because uh, he's basically done one thing uh, <laughs> It's just, you know, breaks the camel's back in terms of the authorities uh, and they call him out. And so he flees and he ends up in France where he meets a, a sort of local petty criminal. And um, they sort of engage on a, a spree of robbing banks um, and they live off the proceeds. Now, it's not that I want to be a bank robber, but th the thing about this book and why it's called The Thought Gang is, is they philosophise in between bank jobs. They philosophise about themselves, their role, money, society... And part of their uh, sort of way that they rob banks increasingly takes on this sort of philosophical bent. And it's sort of um, dilettante or an intellectual sort of bank robber or criminal. There's a certain attraction to that. I mean, I don't really want to be a bank robber, even a philosophical one, but it did have some sort of appeal in relation to this question. So question five, which character cooks the best food in a novel? Um, well, this is quite easy for me in that uh, I'm not a huge uh, Murakami fan, but one of his books is gets in my all-time top 20, which is Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World. And um, it's, it's so clever because it's two seemingly unrelated narratives in different times, but the way he brings it together at the end is, is just stunning. Um, but there's an awful lot of uh, about that, about a detective and the noodles that he eats. <laughs> sort of every moment that he's sort of not uh, on the case of something, uh, he's back in his flat cooking noodles. And uh, Murakami indulges enough, just gives enough detail that um, sort of make them sort of quite mouth-watering. So um, definitely that for me. Question six. Which character do you most want to give a slap to or at least shake them up? OK, um... This is a character done four times in a book, and it's Paul Oster's 4321, which is four alternative narratives for uh, a boy called uh, Archibald Isaac Ferguson, or Archie Ferguson. And it's him as a child, and then him as uh, a teenager. And, and uh, it goes off in four different directions according to sort of choices or random events that happen. But uh, I just want to slap him in all four, or uh, if non violent, give him a shake, because at the end of the day, this is four different versions of a quite a sort of indulged teenager. One of the storylines that his family hit sort of economic dire straits, but basically, New York, quite well off. Um, indulge teenager doing typical teenage things you know sort of you know wanting to get laid uh, sort of having you know sort of political ideals wanting to change the world and all this sort of stuff and I just you know it's bad enough having one version of this guy but to have four I mean oh dear I don't know what Oster was thinking you know I don't understand the mechanism of, of four different or slightly different alternative versions of the same character I, I didn't see what he was after I can't help thinking that this is Oster thinking about his own life and, and the different parts it could have taken but um, it just didn't work for me which I know will upset one booktuber in particular who who, who loves the book uh, and Oster is a really important writer to me you know when he was first writing City of Glass and the New York Trilogy. I mean, it's just stupendous stuff. But for me, he seems to have lost it gradually. So, um, yes, Archie Ferguson. OK, uh, question seven. Which character do you most want to parent or take under your wing? OK, uh, this is the unfortunate Benji in uh, William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury. Um, he stands, all day and every day, he stands at the fence of his parents' property. Uh, which used to be much bigger. It was an old southern plantation, but the mother has sold off most of the land to a golf course, um, and she sells it off because she wants to fund her older son Quentin's uh, university. And uh, Benji stands at the fence, 
And every time he hears the word caddy coming across from the uh, the golf course, he cries, and his mother tells him to belt up. And the reason he cries is because caddy is the the sort of uh, sort of family name for his sister, who's who's left, who's run away from the house, because one of the things is is that Quentin commits suicide, and you know caddy just wants to get away from this whole oppressive family. And if that's not bad enough, that this boy sort of cries every time he sort of mistakenly hears a word that happens to sound like the name of his absent sister. Well, you know, that you just want to sort of, you know, take him under your arm. But you realise that, you know, part of Benji's problem is, you know, when his mother tells him to shut up, I mean, she has no love for this child. She's completely negligent. I mean, she drove one son to suicide and a daughter to flee the family home. And it's just, it's 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 shocking, really. And, and you just you just want to you can't do anything for this kid, Benji, but you wish you could. And that book has some stunning, stunning writing. You know, the deracination of Quentin on his, you know, last days before the decision to commit suicide is just, you know, brilliant. Sort of inside the mind that's sort of coming apart. So can't recommend that book highly enough. Question eight: Which character has the darkest heart? Uh, Patrick Bateman from American Psycho. Um, it's bad enough all this sort of you know lingering detail over these uh, murders that he either fantasizes about or does actually carry out. But what makes his heart more dark, to my mind, is his obsession with designer label clothing and gadgets. I mean, to me, that is the, <laughs> you know the epitome of of, of a soulless being. Um, Patrick Bateman. Sorry, it's you. Although you'd probably warm to the title. Um, question nine. Who's the smartest character you've ever come across? Um, I really like Holden Caulfield in, in Catching the Rye. He's smart because he just he just sees through people, particularly adults, you know, that we're phonies. That to a child, you know, come emerging from childhood and into the adult world. And, and, you know, what a terrible place the adult world is compared with the innocence and the sort of feather-bedded sort of protection of childhood. And, and, and I think those are the anxieties um, uh, driving him. But, you know, he sees that, you know, this is a world he doesn't really want to join, but he knows he can't stay a child forever. So I think he's pretty smart. He's not likeable. But, you know, in, in his assessment of us adults, he's pretty spot on. So I think he's sharp. Uh, question 10. Which character has the strangest fixation? Um... For me, this is a book by Tom McCarthy called Remainder, uh, and the protagonist is never named. The protagonist suffers a brain injury when something falls on him from a great height, and he spends an enormous amount of time in hospital sort of recuperating, having to relearn basic movements, you know, that the brain damage has, has wiped out, and he has to, you know, has to go to this sort of forensic detail of relearning his body. And when he's fully fit, and he has a huge amount of money as a sort of a compensation payout, this sort of a forensic approach to life and sort of dissecting it and breaking down, he takes into some very strange fixations whereby he wants to recreate reality. So he sort of buys up this this sort of property and he sort of erects a tower block that he's sort of vaguely remembered, or not a tower block, an apartment block that he's sort of vaguely remembered. And then he wants to populate it with exactly the houses and, and the businesses that were around it. And he pays people to be active in this scenario it's it's very very strange but it's it's quite effective you know it, it's it's very different but it is a strange fixation and I really enjoyed that book I know it sort of it tends to spit opinions on it where people just think there's no meaning in this um, but I think it's all about his individual obsession having sort of re-experienced the world as an adult having to learn the basic things that we all learn as children such as walking and and doing those sorts of things yourself it for me it worked uh and it's very worthwhile uh question 11 which character just keeps on cussedly pushing down the barriers to get to their goal well the obvious two here are um the curious incident of the dog in the night time and upload and encrypt up close and incredibly loud who are two boys on the autistic uh, asperger's syndrome who overcome you know, being sort of outside of society to achieve their great goals. Uh, but I'm actually going to go for something different because um, in a way they're a bit obvious. And that is uh, Jennifer Egan's latest book, uh, Manhattan Beach, has a character called Anna Kerrigan. It's the Second World War and she's working in a munitions factory that's in a naval dockyard in New York. Uh, and that in itself is difficult. Although women sort of were drafted in, in to help the war effort because obviously a lot of men had gone off to fight, 
it's still a very sexist environment. It's a factory floor and it's in the Navy. So there's sailors walking by all the time and, you know, hassling the, the women and stuff. But that's not the glass ceiling that she that she tilts at breaking. She wants to become a Navy diver to sort of go down uh, into the water to sort of unsnag, uh, you know, propellers or, or reclaim and salvage things. And the barriers she faces and the prejudice she faces, you know, to that. And each time she has to prove that she's better than the men. And, you know, she doesn't use sex. She just uses her ability and her mental sharpness. So, you know, when she, you know, the, 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 diver, the, the, the diving school won't admit her at all. And the excuse is, well, we don't have a suit. But she keeps at it and keeps at it. She gets into it eventually to persuade them to let her have a go. And it's in a man's suit. And she just keeps doing this. And she just keeps knocking down every obstacle put in her way. And, and she's just a, a great character really one you can identify with and, and root for. So for me, it's it's Anna Kerrigan. OK, so um, those are the 11 questions. The 12th is always, who are you going to tag? So um, I'm quite new to all of this. And, uh, the you know, the person who, who introduced me to tags, for which I will remain forever grateful, is Catalyst Reads. Um, he had a brilliant tag called the No Disclaimers tag. Now, when I came across it, it was through another booktube. I didn't realise it was Catalyst Reads. So I'd like to thank him because uh, I didn't acknowledge him in my No Disclaimers tag video. But I'm going to acknowledge him here by sort of saying that he's very welcome to do this tag. Um, as I say, I'm going to post all the all the booktubers' uh, links in the description box, so you can find his channel there. He's a he's a top bloke and, uh, you know, just so generous to, to other booktubers. So he's really worth uh, sort of subscribing to. Uh, the next one is um, Beth Chats Books, who's a, a British uh, uh, blogger who, um, it's very funny, I saw her no disclaimers tag today, and she uses the phrase, uh, what was it now, I can't remember, but it's one I hadn't heard for years, and it just made me laugh, and in fact, consistently in her introduction to the, to the video, she made me laugh, and then as we got on, as she went through the, the disclaimers stuff, I realised that she and I have very similar literary tastes, so um, I'm going to sort of throw this one over to you, Beth, see if uh, you can be willing to share some of your uh, character traits of characters you love and hate. Um, the third one is, and please forgive the pronunciation, because it's I think it sounds like Sylvia, but it's spelled S-I-L-J-E, and she's from Norway. And what is remarkable about Sylvia, apologies, is that, you know, English is not her first language. So not only is she doing videos in English, but she's reading you know, quite difficult texts in English and talking about them, and, and that just totally has my admiration and um, I think she's brilliant so uh, I'm going to tag her and then the last one I'm going to tag is Eric the Lonesome Reader who's probably one of the first booktubers I, I started sort of following and, and, and watching their videos and he's just great he's just so full of sort of bounteous enthusiasm for books uh, he talks sort of you know very honestly and openly about books and everything surrounded with books and I, and I just think he's great so um, I sort of got a sort of debt of gratitude to him that he may not even be aware of but he's sort of introduced me to booktube I suppose indirectly so those are the people I'm going to tag and uh, of course you don't need to be tagged to pick up a tag if you fancy answering these questions as I say they will be down in the description box please feel free and um, till next time when hopefully I will finally get around to talking about the Spaceman of Bohemia, which I've finally finished. Okay, thanks very much.